Hello, everyone. Shh. Hello. <laughs> Hi, we're about to get started. Um, people are taking their seats, but uh, I, want, I would like to kick us off so that we don't fall that much behind schedule. Um, I'm Stavros Gardinis. I'm a professor at Berkeley Law School. Uh, I've been a corporate law professor since 2010. And I can say that this is the most exciting time for corporate law, I think, in my career, because we see this big change in how corporations are responding to climate. And this is why uh, we wanted to convene this meeting. Uh, there is a bunch of new regulations that are coming, but I don't think that the question is just the regulation. We'll talk about regulation, of course. We'll talk about disclosure. We'll talk about the pros and cons. But I think uh, that uh, a change of the uh, depth and size and intensity required to address climate change cannot happen without internal change within companies. And this is why we convened this meeting, and this is why uh, we're getting everyone uh, together. Uh, so we have an exciting day um, planned for you. Uh, we uh, will include all the hardcore legal issues from uh, disclosure to corporate structuring, um, but we will also talk about the policy behind it. We will also talk about the motivations. We will also talk about um, the politics of it. And we will also talk about what lawyers can do and how lawyers are working to change um, uh, corporations from within. So I'm really looking forward to our conversations. Uh, and I, I'll pass it on to Anjali to welcome you. Thank you, Stavros. Welcome, everyone. I'm Anjali Patel, the Executive Director of the Center for Law and Business at Berkeley. Uh, we're putting together this event with a lot of wonderful help, and so I wanted to take a moment to thank some of our sponsors as well as our staff. Uh, particularly, thank you to uh, Lanique Dillia, our student assistants who are joining us today and will be joining us, Irene, uh, Melissa from uh, Morrison & Forrester, Andrea from Weil, uh, we couldn't do this without them. You probably were greeted very warmly by our registration table. Uh, if you like our name tags and our branding, uh, you know, special, special thanks to our staff. I'd also like to thank our sponsors. Putting together something as important as this is really difficult for a university alone. And so we work with a lot of committed individuals who care about these topics. Uh, so I just want to say special thank you to Accenture, Freshfields, uh, Weil, and Morrison Forrester. I'll hand it over to Stavros to give a special thanks to uh, a longtime supporter and board member, Suze McCormack, who has been pivotal in helping us put this together. Uh, and then I'll end with a couple of logistical announcements after Stavros. Thank you. So for this conference, we followed a special process and a lot of you participated in our steering committee because this is a new area. We wanted to make sure that everybody, that we have everything covered and we got a lot of wonderful feedback from uh, many of you. So I'm particularly grateful. And also it was the rare chance to be a student again after being a professor for so long. Uh, but I wanted to uh, thank Susan McCormack specifically because she stood with us throughout this process. She is passionate about this topic. You all know for, for a very long time. And it was wonderful to have someone with her depth of knowledge and expertise uh, to guide us through. So Susan, thank you very much. All right. So if you are curious about what's on the agenda, we tried to be as conscious of the environment as possible and did not print anything uh, to the extent possible. So please do take a look on our website for the agenda. Uh, it, there is a QR code at your table uh, so you can follow along. Uh, for those joining us virtually, yes, this is a hybrid event and we have a lot of folks joining us online. Uh, please uh, take a look at the link in the chat. This will be used for you to access your CLE credit. You must sign into that in order to get your credits. And then finally, uh, we will be sticking to the schedule, which means that we won't have time for Q&A. Uh, it's a packed day. So uh, without uh, any further ado, it is my deepest honor to bring and invite to the stage uh, our keynote conversation. I will let 
uh, our moderator and conversationalist uh, introduce our keynote, but welcoming to the stage, Suze McCormack and Janine Guglio. Can you guys hear? Okay, great. Um, welcome. Uh, thank you so much. I, it's, a, it's an honor uh, to, to start this off. Colin LeDuc, who I've been working with for about 20 years at Just Climate, is actually very ill um, and kept thinking he could make it and let us know that he could not last night. Um, but I am really honored uh, that um, I spoke to Janine at 9.30 last night and she was game by 9.30 this morning. So that, that's how we roll. Um, here um, at Berkeley. I just, I want to say a word to about Stavros and Angeli. This is, and I've done my research because I actually teach climate governance here at Berkeley. Um, this is the first conference about climate on the corporate side um, at any law school in the country. So the fact that Berkeley is, is taking a leading role here, I think is, is, is really, really special and speaks a lot about the institution and the people who, who, who work and teach here. Um, because really, for years, climate was the purview of litigators, environmental litigators, and compliance. It was like, let's look at the Clean Air Act, and let's tell companies, investors, what they can and can't do. So when I started focusing on climate in 2001, there were, from a corporate pr perspective, I am a corporate lawyer, there was very little going on at that time. Um, but the few people who were in this space at investors and at companies and firms found each other. Um, and as Stavros indicated, there has been a sea change on the corporate side of the house. And that's what we're going to be introducing to you over the next uh, day and a half. With that said, um, what can I say about Janine? I'm going to give you a little bit of your ba her background, because like many people who are focused in this space, space she has a broad and, and deep expertise in a variety of areas. She actually started her career at Ernst & Young, um, became a very senior accountant. That will be relevant a little bit, a little bit later. She was then 20 years at banking, ending up um, at, at Bank of America and Barclays, ending up as the COO of Barclays. So not, not insignificant roles, um, actually very significant roles. She then went to CalPERS, um, ended up being their chief operational investment officer. Um, and then she, I got to know her quite well when she became the head of SASB, the Sustainable Accounting Standards Board. And I'm not doing her justice, um, but I'm really honored. And I think she's going to give us a little bit of a framework for the conference um, and, and looking at, at climate from an investor perspective. So you started in banking, and then you ended up at CalPERS. And I, as you'll hear, I think Tim's going to be leading us off on the next panel talking about, you know, ESG as a term started in 2004 with the UN report, you know, who, you know, who cares wins, which really identified many of the sort of ESG factors as being material to the bottom line. But you were very instrumental in integrating this at, at CalPERS. Why don't we start there, Janine? Yeah, so I'll start at CalPERS, and, and I joined CalPERS in 2010. And I would say at that point, CalPERS was, was already perceived as a, as a real leader on corporate governance. Um, but we were still finding our way in terms of what you might today call integrating ESG into the investment portfolio. And there were a very broad array of opinions across our board of trustees, the investment teams, um, and our stakeholders. So, so we embarked on an investment beliefs project. I led that project, two-year project to develop our investment beliefs, which were guiding principles for managing the investment portfolio, the entire portfolio, the whole multi-asset portfolio, which was new thinking at the time because most people who were thinking about in, what we'd call impact investing at that time were thinking about a slice of the portfolio. Um, and we were saying, okay, well, how do you, how do you manage the whole portfolio? Um, and of those investment beliefs, there were 10 or 12. Um, three of them are what we would today call sustainability-related beliefs. One is that being a long-term investor is a responsibility, not only an advantage. We had always thought about it as an advantage because of li liquidity. You can provide liquidity, um, but but it's a responsibility and explicitly calling out the concept of a responsibility to future generations of 
both taxpayers and beneficiaries. Um, that was one. Second one was that delivering long-term returns required effective management of three forms of capital, environmental capital, human capital, financial capital. And then I'd say the one that was probably most relevant to climate was being a long-term investor and actually thinking about managing risk as a long-term investor, risk is more multifaceted than volatility. So if you only have ever seen risk reports in big financial institutions, there are almost always these pages of volatility analysis. And we said, no, risk is more multifaceted than volatility. It includes things that evolve over very long time horizons, and we explicitly called out climate. Um, so I would say those investment beliefs were groundbreaking. They became pretty uh, models for big pension funds around the world, actually. They did, and and I, I was practicing this space back then, and and PERS was, was seen as a leader. Now it's sort of, of course we should be evaluating climate risk. Um, but let me just pause on that. Of course, we should be as asset managers and institutional investors focusing on climate risk because we have, over the last two and a half years, seen a rise in the anti-ESG movement. And in fact, for those of you who haven't checked your feeds, um, BlackRock um, is being sued by the Attorney General of Mississippi for um, disclosure failure related to ESG as of they was announced this morning. So that is just one of many. I could give you probably 15 or 20 other examples. Um, Janine, I'm going to sort of take you from, you know, 10, 15 years ago to now. Institutional investors, from my perspective, are still looking at their asset managers and telling, asking them, hey, you need to make sure you're measuring and reporting to us and evaluating climate risk. Is, uh, am I correct in that assessment? And tell me a little bit about how both institutional investors and asset managers are looking at this in the wake of the anti-ESG. Yeah, so I think, you know, I think we've gone through this big evolution. So if you go back 10 to 15 years, uh, people were talking a lot about impact investing. And impact investing at that point really had a kind of connotation of a some sort of a discretionary return. So then we kind of moved to this language, ESG integration, which was really, really focused on through the lens of business performance, investment performance, risk and return. Then the, the ESG language started morphing back to impact language. You know, we need to address climate change. And I think what kind of caused the ESG backlash is in talking and shifting that language back towards impact language, we need to address climate change. The explicit link to why the business case got a little lost. And so I think um, the backlash to me is a result of that business case getting a little bit lost. And that's why I think substantively the institutional investors and asset managers are not changing where they're going. They're just re-anchoring back and we're doing this because there's a business case which is around the resilience of our portfolios and long-term returns. And we're seeing a lot of what, what we're advising clients and what we're seeing a lot of is just change of terminology, not actual change in behavior because climate risk is as, you know, starting, you know, 30 years ago is a, is a business risk. It's a business risk. And I think the ESG language got really convoluted around that and kind of lost that business risk connection. And my theory on, on why it happened is you had the 2004 report and it came out and landed when companies were looking at corporate social responsibility and investors were doing double, triple, quadruple bottom line um, investing. And it kind of got spread and, and folks like GRI and, you know, sort of reporting across a spectrum. Some of the elements are material, some of them are not. But if you look at, and this conference is going to focus on law and business, uh, but really how, how corporate behavior and law is changing, it's really in two different areas, right? You have corporate behavior and you have corporate disclosure. Yeah. And Janine, I want to start with you with corporate behavior. And again, I keep going, I feel like I keep going back and forth in time you know, what have you seen over the last, you know, 15, 20 years and changes of corporate behavior as it's gone from corporate social responsibility, let's have a little foundation, foundations being the death of the planet, um, let's have a, 
um, you know, let's plant a tree to mainstream part of operations. Yeah. So, and I think this disclosure behavior conversation is really interesting because I think it's a chicken or an egg, right? Does disclosure drive behavior or does behavior drive disclosure? We're starting with behavior. We'll go to disclosure. With behavior, we'll go to disclosure. But um, I think that in some ways, I actually think corporate behavior hasn't changed. Now, I'll go back to the start of my career where I, you know, when I started my career at Bank of America, we talked about managing multiple stakeholders. We were very clear that what would drive our long-term success is, is, is delivering value for multiple stakeholders. So I think in some ways, we're actually just still saying that we're delivering companies to deliver long-term success need to deliver value to multiple stakeholders. I think what has materially changed is what that means today is significantly more complex than what it may have meant 30 years ago. And so it, the problems are more complex, they're more global, climate, income inequality, diversity, equity, and inclusion. These, like, how to deliver value today, to me, is much more complex. So I, I think companies are now really trying to embed stakeholder management in their cultures and their operations um, in a much more sophisticated way than maybe 30 years ago. No, I agree. And and lawyers are more in the picture. So we've been working with corporate counsel for a number of years ago. Five years ago, the average person in-house at a company, it, when asked about climate and ESG, it was less than 20% um, said, yes, it is a focus. Now it's between 80 and 90%. So yeah. part of that is because there's more regulation, but part of that is this understanding that this this is actually part and parcel of every piece of the operations. And I know yeah. we'll, we'll get to BCG and B-Labs in a second. <laughs> um, but the other thing that is driving a lot of the focus, obviously, of lawyers is, is disclosure. And for those of you who don't know, Janine um, headed SASB for a long time. SASB, the Sustainable Accounting Standard Board, was actually born of the issue that I mentioned. It was born of the fact that ESG was tied to materiality. It came out. It got morphed. And there was a group of people who said, hey, we need to make sure that we are identifying what of these factors are material to operations for purposes of disclosure. And I, I was a founding board member of SASB, and then I got to know Janine quite a bit when she came in to run it. But now, one of the interesting things on the disclosure, you had all of this voluntary disclosure rubric, which most companies were starting to follow. And now you have required disclosure, and you have required disclosure that is not consistent. You have California... China, SEC, EU, and then you have, and I know Verity is here, we're going to be talking about sort of S2 under IFRS, a lot of acronyms. You have an, an international voluntary standard that is being adopted more or less um, intact by about 120 regulators around the world. So if you're a company or investor, Janine, there's no better person than tell us what to do about that. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's ironic that we're ending up where we are. Okay, so, um, so, so the path to disclosure and and the reason I got so focused on disclosure does come back to Calpers Investment Beliefs, which is I knew we couldn't implement the things we set out in the beliefs without what I would call investor quality data, comparable, consistent, reliable information about material, material to business performance, sustainability factors. That's really what SASB did. SASB was groundbreaking in creating a framework for disclosure based on those concepts. We then, and I think with, as you said, voluntary, the whole sustainability disclosure landscape was voluntary, and I think it went through this classic change curve. A lot of chaos, a lot of different organizations formed for different purposes, um, and we did a huge amount of effort to consolidate the voluntary landscape under the ISSB, International Sustainability Standards Board, which uh, Verity will talk about a little later. Um, the theory when we did that was that regulators would adopt the ISSB as a global baseline in the same way that IFRS accounting standards are a global baseline in most countries except the US, different topic, um, but that we would really aim to achieve that the ISSB standards would become a global baseline adopted by regulators around the world. 
And we are seeing great progress towards that. Verity can talk about it later. But we are in a significant fragmented environment right now because we have the SEC on one end doing its thing, which I call the minimal solution for investors. We have the EU. Doing, yes. <laughs> you said it, not me. <laughs> we have the maximal. The EU is definitely doing the maximal solution, which, which is a huge amount of information with a risk it becomes a compliance exercise. The ISSB, I feel, is in the kind of just right middle um, with the right intellectual framework. But we really, really need um, companies and investors through a policy effort to really um, advocate in each of those regulatory jurisdictions for ISSB adoption. Without that, you will have regulatory fragmentation around the world. And so I think particularly since this is a legal conference and many of you are really engaged in your policy efforts, uh, the only thing that is gonna prevent regulatory fragmentation is policy efforts from both companies and investors. I completely agree. So um, I could talk to you all day, but I'm gonna <laughs> ask you um, one final question here. Um, what do you see as next on the corporate side for climate? Um, well, I definitely think getting your disclosure house in order is a first, first like foundational layer. Um, and I still think in terms of just, you know, getting the climate data into a mandated world with the governance and the controls that you have in the financial accounting world, that's just like table stakes now. Um, but it's a heavy lift for most companies. Um, but then I think it's how to take that information, translate it to action. And um, all the focus on disclosure will have been a waste of time if it doesn't result in better decisions and action. So I think um, how to actually meaningfully uh, set targets and make progress around uh, climate and emissions is really crucial. No, I agree. And at lunch, um, you're going to hear from Spencer Glendon, who is a luminary in the space. Again, we're pulling in some people from the business side because they influence the corporate and, and the law. One of the things I know he will say is we've already surpassed 1.5 degrees. We are on a collision course with um, a really, really bleak future. And there is no way that regulation can keep pace. It is not. I mean, one of the reasons that there's so much action on the corporate side and, you know, we're going to talk in this conference about governance and form and in the investor side is because the government has been for the last 20, 25 years, pretty much absent. So that's 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 why this conference is so important in terms of looking, because I think I think regulation is going to continue to trail. Um, and so the actions of companies and investors is just really, really important um, for the future of our planet. So. Janine, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. We're going to give it up. Thank you. Well, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for those wonderful remarks. Uh, we are going to stay to time. A quick logistical announcement. This con these conversations here today are off the record. Uh, tomorrow we'll have a couple of breakout sessions which will be held under Chatham House rules. Uh, just just for everyone to know. For those joining us online, don't forget about your CLE credits. And then we are now getting ready to go down to our next session on uh, climate's role in ESG. For those who have not had a chance to take a look at the agenda, right after this will be coffee break. Please bear with us as we get through the conversation, though I think you're going to want to hear a lot. So without further ado, I'd love to welcome the next panelists, Liz, Berkeley, and Tim to the stage. can't see you guys. Well, welcome everyone. You just saw me at the podium. Now I'm moderating this panel. Uh, very, very excited to kick off our conversation. Uh, the goal of this panel is to really unpack and kind of stir the pot a little bit on the various conversations we'll be having uh, for the next day and a half. Uh, we'll introduce some of the larger topics around regulation, voluntary frameworks, uh, carbon accounting, 
uh, and, and we've had a great panel. I'm gonna pass it on to our panelists to introduce themselves uh, and give us a little bit about their background and what brings them uh, uh, to the world that they are in now. So Tim, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure, happy to kick off. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much to Berkeley for organizing this amazing conference. Um, I am the Global Client Sustainability Partner, which is a relatively new title. About five years ago, I took the role, and now I'm very pleased to see that many other law firms are also having a similar role. What it means is we are advising clients across the ESG spectrum. Of course, I'll focus mainly on climate today, but it's quite interesting that we saw our clients moving uh, the issues of sustainability into the strategic realm, shall I say. So boards, CEOs, CFOs, general counsel were looking at issues, whether they're transaction issues, acquiring renewable assets, regulatory issues, which we had the previous discussion um, talking about, as well as litigation. So we've been quite busy. Hi, I'm Berkeley Rothmeyer. Um, I'm a director in the consumer sectors and climate teams at BSR, a business for social responsibility, where we work with the private sector in pursuit of our mission of a more just and sustainable world where we all exist and can thrive on a healthy planet. Um, we are a nonprofit, and I come from the environmental science side um, and have been working with companies largely on climate, freshwater, and other environment issues um, for my entire career thus far. Um, and really looking forward to, to digging in with these panelists on where we are now, what it means, and how we can partner across different functions, including legal, um, uh, within companies to really drive impact and progress, not just disclosure and compliance. And I'm Liz Donahue. I head up policy and government relations for Blue Triton Brands. We're a, um, a beverage company that specializes only in water. Uh, and we are, you'll know us as brands like Arrowhead, Pure Life, if you're from the East Coast, Poland Springs, Saratoga. Uh, and we have a 150 year legacy of sustaining those, those brands and our water sources. We also operate a home and office delivery network called Ready Refresh. And we have one of the largest reusable networks in the country. Uh, our business is drinking water. And the only way we exist is if water is sustainable and our sources are sustainable. So we live this every day. Uh, and it and it drives what we do. We are, uh, because I'm where I, I sit in policy and government relations, and I originally come from the public sector, um, I, ex I identify as legally adjacent, and I am home of preserving our social license to operate. So we are talking about stakeholders all the time, how we operate and what we do in the communities of where we operate and, and all the way up. And we have investors and owners who are very much focused on how we deal and address with climate. Well, I am very flattered to be sitting on stage with the three of you. Uh, quick uh, show of hands, I like to kick off panels with a little bit of a poll. How many folks already work in sustainability, broadly speaking? All right, so for the folks uh, on this panel, just FYI. Uh, <laughs> uh, so let's, let's dig in. Uh, a little bit of what Suze and Janine were bringing up was this moniker of ESG. And over, over the past, I'd say even three or so years, we've seen climate kind of stand out as a little different from, uh, or at least it's been uh, separated in, a, in the way it has been talked about, used. Uh, I guess my question is for you, Berkeley, what do you think are the motivating factors for why climate has seen a uh, a different uh, response, maybe from uh, regulatory to internal reforms, the way companies think about it, uh, whether that's from a standard setting perspective, just what, what stands out from your standpoint working with multiple companies in the consumer brand sector? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And when I started my career, I went into freshwater because it, I felt like it was the primary vector of climate change and it was something everybody understood. It was much more tangible um, and relatable. Uh, than climate was at the time. Similarly, that's why I work in consumer sectors. We all interact with the consumer sector um, as, and we have played different stakeholder roles in that. Um, and I think climate is a fascinating problem. We've heard it referred to as a wicked problem. It really brings, sort of crystallizes a number of 
global, you know, structural challenges, whether it's inequity, uh, development, et cetera, it's a true global problem. Um, it's something that we share, but there are also measurable pieces of it. We can measure a carbon footprint. We can measure point sources on emissions. You know, we can, there are numbers that we can track and we need those numbers to have, have a common language and have something to hold each other accountable by. Um, I see it kind of similar to the way we've latched onto the concept of GDP as a measure of success because it's quantitative and it works. And I think similarly, there are some potential pitfalls um, and broader things that are not necessarily captured in climate as a an emissions conversation. But I think that combination of truly global, also the urgency um, and how scary the climate challenge is becoming and can be brings people to the table plus that, that ability to measure. I, I find it fascinating the point on being able to measure something, giving it kind of the uh, teeth, I guess, if it, that, that climate has now started to have for companies, for regulators. Tim, question for you. Uh, it, what do you see as uh, the reasoning for why regulators are latching on a lot more to climate? Uh, it once, and in, in some parts, is still a little controversial, but I mean, for the most part, I think globally speaking, climate as an issue has gained a lot of traction. What do you think it is from a government and a regulator standpoint? I think that point on measurability is really an important one. And I love the fact that Janine and Suze gave us the history of how we got there, because part of the advice that we had been giving clients in a voluntary world was about storytelling. It was, as you remember, these sustainability reports, and they were getting legal advice on it, but it really was much more of how do we put our story out there, both on the risk of climate uh, impacting our business, as well as opportunities, you know, positive ways that we're impacting water and other sources. So it was quite interesting for me that the regulators would pick up on what were voluntary storytelling and making sure it wasn't, uh, how can I put it, voluntary greenwashing or schmoozing in a way that was misleading those investors. And so the connection to the investor story is really an important one. I will have to say a little caveat, though, that a lot of our clients as investors were pushing more for data and information a lot of the clients felt that there were starting to be tick-to-the-box exercises with lots of questionnaires coming from investors that didn't relate exactly to how they could move the dial on um, various climate change initiatives that they were pushing. And so welcoming, in some ways, what governments and regulators are doing to say, here's a standard uh, piece that we can go for. The only question is, is the standard piece something that really still tells the most important and relevant stories um, for those companies on climate change. Well, you know, I think that that really brings me, uh, I want to hear the company perspective on this because, um, uh, Liz, you're in a part of quote unquote climate that is actually water. And when we talk GHG, it's not the first thing that comes to your mind when you say water. Um, how does this climate conversation capture the work that you do? And where do you see the role of water in all of this? I think this goes directly to what Berkeley was saying about how climate is more encompassing. Um, water scarcity is a risk that we, we have to address or the perception of the fear of water scarcity is something we have to address all the time and be ready for. And so we have, you know, we see ourselves as water stewards. Uh, we have been long before any of us were talking about climate change. Uh, and now we have to put it into this parlance um, and put certain governance structures around it. And I think that's something um, that's really critical in terms of preserving um, the good practices that our company has taken for granted for years. Uh, and I, I, that's um, quite important. And giving the reassurance, right? that we are following the regulations around water and permitting that are already out there. Um, but this does raise another challenge that I'm sure we're gonna get into, but consumers or citizen advocates don't trust regulation. 
as much as they used to. And, and then they don't trust corporations either. And it's kind of on two sides. I, this was explained explicitly to us by, we were at a, we have a large footprint in Maine. Um, and the chamber president uh, said, he goes, look, things have changed since I, I went away and I came back. He goes, and Republicans don't trust corporations anymore. And the Democrats and the legislatures don't believe in regulation and science anymore. And we have to figure out how to deal with this. And that is the real challenge. And so we look to like third parties and other partners to try and give us um, that credibility in this space while we're while we're dealing with it. But water is. I mean, OK, well, let, <laughs> let's talk about that challenge a little bit because you're bringing it up. I, I think what better time to talk about it? Uh, well, regulators, for better or worse, are involved. You know, there are a lot of regulations in Europe, specifically um, the U.S. is trying uh, to have a little bit more regulation around, at least disclosures for now. Uh, Tim, tell us, and, and Berkeley too, uh, uh, what do you see as uh, the challenges that are coming as a result of these regulators uh, entering the climate scene, creating the regulations that they do? I mean, there's clearly a number of them. So if you can just kick us off and then we, the rest of you can answer the number of issues that you see. You want to do the first 50 and I'll take the next? Or? Why don't you go ahead? <laughs> no, I, I think I would echo a lot of, you know, what we heard in our, our opening plenary um, that, you know, there's, we're trying to find the sweet spot and trying to find where decision useful information that enables action in the right direction lives and how to um, convince as many stakeholders as possible to provide and use that data appropriately. Um, you know, there, there are challenges with regulation. I think these are the same challenges in climate as we see in regulating anything, and particularly financial regulations and market regulations. Um, I think one of the big risks um, that I see and, and hope that we can, can steer away from a bit is the risk, um, as, as Janine mentioned, that this becomes purely a check the box or a compliance exercise and we have to dedicate so much energy, so much labor and time to learning how to comply that it takes away from efforts to address the problems um, and have the impacts that we're trying to drive with that regulation in the first place. Um, I think there's also a challenge of making sure we have the right stakeholders at the table, that we have people who understand the right facets of the problem, both from the market side, from the company side, from the science side, to get as close as we can to those right metrics. And we need to, you know, we need to be humble in what we each bring to the table and recognize the gaps and actively work to fill those gaps to improve our chances at getting getting at the, you know, the right framework and the right regulation. Oh, Berkeley's nailed it. I, I would just add, um, when you talk about these check the box uh, exercises and just giving very practical uh, tips on what we've been seeing with our clients, this is going to be very expensive for them to comply. So they better get it right. We've been hearing numbers like a million dollars a year devoted to just getting the compliance right. And so the CSRD is an interesting example. I think in the last two weeks, I've had five clients ask whether we should just comply with one particular enterprise in Germany. It's a small little sales organization that's getting caught up in this, or is this the right time to do the full enterprise double materiality because we'll be able to use this um, for other uh, regulators? The question is, will they be able to use it? So with CSRD in particular, in terms of the enterprise level, we're still waiting for new rules that are gonna come out in 2027. Um, the SEC has specifically said that compliance with one regulation is not going to suffice for compliance with the others. Um, so I'm a little bit worried around, I, I, Form shopping is probably the wrong word, but sort of trying to just divide and conquer just to um, so, uh, basically fulfill that particular regulatory concern, which, you know, again, from my perspective, can we find a way to go back to that narrative storytelling where it really is compliance disclosure that's giving the investors exactly the information they need to make decisions about 
the impact of those companies on uh, climate change, and hopefully also to be able to start talking about opportunities again, where companies can be a little bit bolder about what they might do in the future to address it. At the moment, um, there's been uh, quite a bit of shyness, and we haven't used the L word yet, and that is litigation threats, and they're all over the place. OK, but I have to ask, uh, Liz, does regulation help or hinder in your experience at a company that's in such a climate central space? I, I feel uh, both ways on this. Um, I think it helps because it standardizes it across the industry and the more standardization, one, it, you know, our competitors are doing it too. It's not just us out there. So that's helpful. Um, and c it also helps us to justify it to, you know, our CFO and finance that this is, we have to do it so you can't cut our budget. Like I do, I do think that's, it, it forces it into the company in a different way. On the other side, it does just make it check the box and, and do, do you just get the bare minimum out of it? So I, I think there's two sides to it, but it does become table stakes. Um, and do, do you still have to do more than that, right? Like when everyone's doing it, can you differentiate yourself in the market? And, and do you get, and this is my fear is you disclose and then you still need on the other side to do, you know, some some project that gets you a headline from my perspective with the community that you exist in. And that work you actually need to do to drive change, the middle work is ignored because you you got those two sides. You know, you satisfied your CEO and your communications because you're out there and, and people know that you're doing something good and you satisfied on the compliance side, but the the you know, the folks internally are kind of left hanging when they they want, to, I, our, our um, associates definitely want us to see us making strides in this direction. So I think that well, what is, is the part I don't about, want to leave out. What is it about, say, I mean, checkbox doesn't have to be so checkbox, right? So what is it about it that turns it in? Is it the, the sheer quantity of information you have to gather? Or, you know, what is the roadblock to uh, not making it a checkbox? How could a regulation actually enable a true strategic change? Um, I, I, we just don't get to hear about that. Enough. I think part of it is the quantity. And there is a little bit of, um, we're playing whack-a-mole. Whack like one pops up over here and then California's got theirs. And, and what if New York does something, you know, and, and nothing's going to happen in Congress. And, you know, the SEC comes out, but then it's, on hold, and so I think there's a little bit of that going on. So it, uh, exactly to what Tim was saying, you're not there's like this start stop thing. Um, okay. Well, you know, this brings me to my question, and this is for you, Tim. Uh, well, climate is a global issue. Everyone agrees it is. There's a, even a global standard for measuring GHGs. There's a lot there that's standardized now, and yet governments take such different approaches. Uh, what? How can we make sense of that? Why would something as uh, uniform, if you would, and impact perhaps maybe in some degrees or forms different elsewhere, but why would governments tackle it so differently? Great. We get to talk about politics now. <laughs> I did say we're going <laughs> to stir the pot. Is part of the forum? We can uh, <laughs> include that. Um, it is quite interesting, and for those of you who are in the weeds following uh, the latest back and forth on the CSDDD, which is another uh, EU um, now related more to uh, supply chain disclosures, there was a great little uh, political moment where Germany was kind of saying, uh, no, actually, we're not quite sure. We're happy with its current form after being a big champion and supporter of this. Um, what we found is that, and Germany has a German Supply Act, um, due diligence disclosure requirements, which they're very pleased about. And so they wanted to certainly make sure that these measure up with anything that the EU will do. I would say that regulators appreciate that they each have different political forces that are pushing on them. We certainly saw that in the SEC when their proposed rules on climate attracted more comments than ever for any other regulation in the SEC. Um, we have um, different factions within Europe moving. Um, and Asia kind of watching and learning, but certainly um, China, I think, will be coming out a little bit stronger and boldly. So I think politics is relevant for that. But I also think that, and this is more thinking about advising my clients, 
companies will tend to conform to the first, you know, who's first out the gate, who are going to be the various disclosure requirements and fit those. And then maybe, Janine, they do go back and start lobbying the other government regulators saying, come on, we've already changed all our systems to fit this one. Could you please do this one? So first mover advantage governments, if you can race and get your standards out there first, um, that's another reason why you're seeing um, them coming out with different standards. But I do think the political piece is real. Okay, well, let's just go right into it. Let's talk about the anti-ESG backlash. I know everyone wants to talk about this, so here we go. And this is a question for uh, all of you, because I think each of you can bring a very different perspective. And we'll start with you, Liz, because you mentioned a little bit of this um, kind of from a local standpoint. You know, are we in an era of backlash on things like ESG? Am I saying ESG and climate too conflating? Because that could be a thing, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yeah, I th there's a lot of semantics in this for sure. Um, I think the those who are fighting ESG, they're coming at it from a very superficial, at least in the media, from a very superficial perspective. And I think the emphasis is really about the S and not the E or the G. Um, and I think this has to do with our own, corp you know, fighting back against corporations who are now taking a stand on being diverse and equitable and tolerant and inclusive and emphasizing belonging. And I, I don't think that changes anything that we do as businesses, except in places where that gets headlines, you know, we're kind of keeping our head down because we're not going to sacrifice our employees' well-being because of their political um, attention needs, right? But I, I think otherwise, I think what's the other piece that's driving the the backlash, I think this is just, again, about change. And this is the evolution, right? We, we went this way, and now we got to come back a little, you know, two steps forward, one step back. And then we'll get used to it, and we'll move on again. This is not about the fear of change, though. I think it's the fear of loss, and that this, the world is, you know, everything is changing always. Climate makes it much more urgent. Um, and whether we call it climate or natural disaster or extreme weather events, you know, people are feeling it and that fear that the, the way they've lived life is going to change is, is something um, or that they cannot live life the way they thought they could is, is causing an anxiety. And we see that through the political process. I'll, I'll jump in. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I 100% agree that the E isn't also in the crosshairs. And maybe, and, and some of you know this, and uh, given that this is a, a lawyer's conference, there were about 40 lawyers, heads of various ESG sustainability practices, who received a letter questioning um, our advice on um, ESG issues, in particular, something they referred to as climate cartels. And most of you are familiar with the most famous cartel in the world. Uh, that would be OPEC. So climate cartel was, was a new one for me. But it was a definite approach of a concern around what are the legal advice, which, you know, interesting to go after the lawyers. By the way, many of our clients also got the letter. And I know in the investment community, you guys got some letters also. Um, but a, a clear question about this change happening and in particular certain industries and in certain states, if they might be deprived of the funding that's going to make capital more expensive for them to raise money to do the various, whether it's oil and gas projects or otherwise. So I think that that backlash is real. The other backlash, um, and you know, people refer to it as kind of a, a chilling effect, um, is certainly worries about where the regulation is going to go. Um, I think that it is fair for us to say that, let's just take the US for example, regulators do have a fair amount of discretion on issues like the EPA on environmental issues, SEC, will they be enforcing, will they continue to push on the litigation that's come up already, as she said, about the new SEC disclosure rules. 
Um, but how about the Department of Labor? Department of Labor has swapped back and forth their advice on whether pensions, which Janine, you were talking about, in terms of their ability to invest incorporating ESG factors. I think that that type of risk and discretion around the margin in the backlash is quite a, a dangerous one. So fortunately, the New Hampshire uh, legislature, I, I think some of you might have seen this, he wanted to make incorporating ESG factors illegal, a, a punishable crime, up to 10 years in prison if you considered ESG factors in New Hampshire. That didn't go anywhere. Okay, so they, they jumped a little too far. But on the other margin piece, on sort of some of the federal, I think that that chilling effect is real out there and our clients are experiencing it. I mean, I, I, Berkeley, tell us if this is showing up from an industry-wide perspective and, and from your standpoint, uh, is, this, is there a chilling effect or is it, what's, how are companies maneuvering? Because I, I can imagine there's a maneuvering that's happening. Yeah, absolutely. And Tim, let's be honest, Climate Cartel Day was pretty exciting for everybody in the <laughs> climate community when we made it. You know, like if there's nothing that signals that something's mainstream, like that level of fear, right? And that level of engagement. So while there are certainly challenges that we all are grappling, challenges we're all grappling with today and, and every day, um, I think that is an important piece of this is that for years and years, this was a voluntary discussion. This was a science-driven discussion, an advocacy or activist-driven discussion. And now we're squarely in the economic, financial, geopolitical mainstream. And so now we have to deal with everything that comes with that. Um, and it's what we wanted, what many of us pushed for for our entire careers. But now we're here, and it's an adjustment. Um, and I think one of the big things I'm seeing playing out with our member companies is recognizing um, what skills they have and whose skills are no longer the skills needed for their job or for their specialty. And it's similar to, you know, the, like a startup curve um, in terms of recognizing there's a whole different set of skills um, and, you know, people and talents that are useful at different stages of business development. And I think that's really playing out, particularly in large multinational companies where, you know, the sustainability team is realizing, oh, we really need legal finance accounting on board here. We need leadership at the most senior levels on our board in our C-suite to be competent on some issues that were not in the conversation, you know, 10 or 20 years ago. And how do we join hands in actual partnership, effective, efficient partnership to be able to manage the regulatory side as well as the narrative, the backlash, the storytelling um, in navigating those multiple stakeholders. And we you know, need to sort of bring all those stakeholders along with the journey and they're all experiencing those challenges in different ways too. And that's a huge, that's a huge to-do list um, for everyone on this. But I think that, I like to think that we're in a period of adjustment rather than backlash. Um, and we're always in a bit of a period of adjustment. People like to fight. We like to have perspectives. We like to engage. And I think, I, I hope, um, that, again, it signals that this is, is really on the agenda, that we are in a place now to mobilize what's necessary and at the level and speed to address these challenges. And if we can just get through the, you know, the sticky beginning or, you know, mushy middle, then we can come out, you know, with something effective. Can, can I, I agree with both of you on, on that. I'll give you, there's more E to it, but um, <laughs> I think changing our, our language around it, and this goes back to what Susan and Janine were saying also, right? Like, no longer is it, you have to know the audience you're talking to at that moment. And investors may want one thing and your public officials may want something else, right? You don't go to Texas and talk about climate in the same way you do in New York or New England or California. You do talk about it as a business problem and that there is risk associated with it and you're trying to mitigate that risk. And now you have a different, you're having a different conversation. And so I think there is room to do it. You just have to know who you're talking to. Well, I mean, give me an example, and, and this can, this is a question for all of you. How, what does it look like in a, a more of a day-to-day -day sense to maneuver? I mean, when you receive a letter from a congressman or someone like that saying that, you know, cease all activity or tell us, you know, we're coming after you, it's a pretty concrete thing. There's got to be some action that a company or an organization has to take as a response. So, you know, if you can bring to life what it looks like to actually maneuver something like the backlash, because I think that's what's going to help 
anyone who's listening that might want to uh, deal with it themselves, right? So I I any examples that come to your mind? Sure. Uh, oh, oh, go ahead. No, no, no. I have not received the letters. So oh, <laughs> <laughs> lucky me. Only for the letters. I'm kidding. Um, well, I, I would say, um, and, and this sounds like a, a negative uh, piece, but you know the term green hushing that's become. So there certainly was a lot more, let's be so out front and talk about the things that we're doing. Um, uh, many of my clients just sort of very practically, they've made these big investments already. I mean, when you think about investing in renewable energy projects, right, these are long-term project investments. And oh, by the way, thank you for that Inflation Reduction Act. There's real money behind supporting those uh, investments. So they're going to keep going forward with that. But you know, raising your head above the parapet and shouting about it has been sort of a, a practical way that people are going forward. What, what worries me a little bit about green hushing is we still do, and I'd love Berkeley's thoughts on this, need those leading companies who other corporates are going to follow because it is quite clear that, and, and I've ha even had one general counsel just said, Tim, whatever you do, put me smack in the middle of the pack. I never want to be ahead. I don't want to be a lagger. Put me smack in the middle of the pack. But when you have too much green hushing, nobody can sort of lead in which others can gather around. So I'd love your thoughts there. Yeah, I, I have some of those members as well who routinely remind me, I do not want to be a leader. Like, please don't put me in that position. Leadership is hard. Um, and, but I think what we're seeing across our member network, as you mentioned, is, you know, not a retrenching or a backing away from action and activities and investment. There is a reevaluation of how you're talking about it and what, what drivers you're responding to and how, and from the consumer sector's perspective, I think there is potential, um, for it to be actually a very positive development because it's forcing brands to really look at, you know, is what we're saying bullshit? Is, can we back this up? If this, you know, if someone comes to us with a challenge and we haven't, hasn't come up yet, but the consumer protection laws are also increasingly um, uh, interacting with climate and environment and other, um, you know, sustainability attributes from a consumer protection standpoint. Um, and I think it also has drawn attention from different parts of the business that may be dismissed climate and ESG as a, you know, consumer marketing or communications exercise and has raised the level of attention and rigor in a potentially positive way. Um, so I think when it spurs that conversation, it's a good thing. And we should be looking at, you know, why are we communicating this information? How can we back it up? How do we know it's true? Um, can I can I bring that to bear and that preparation side, whether it's about a goal you're announcing or something on a product hang tag or whatever you're putting out there, um, the number one thing that I've been you know advising members on and, and thinking about is literally just the simple fact of is it true? How do you know? Um, and having that ready, uh, I think, is is invaluable. And same for having your um, you know, your values, your charter, your approach codified, kind of having those, that be the basis of all the actions that you take so that when a crisis comes up or a change happens or some kind of flashpoint, you're not just completely reacting. You're going back to a base and you have, you know, some of that, that backing and, you know, ammunition to bring to the conversation in, in a rigorous way. Um, but it is, it is enormously challenging and I do see risk in that green hushing um, in that we don't want to just be cutting down tallest poppies. Um, we, you know, we do want to be supporting leadership and innovation. And that's the piece that worries me is if we're chilling innovation, innovation and positive risk taking in some of those areas. Um, I think that that is potentially detrimental to the progress overall. No, actually, I, I was going to ask, I would want to hear your opinion. I mean, would you I guess in your in your perspective and, and being at a company that, like I said, is is grappling with this from a local standpoint, but also in just the industry you're in, you have to care about ESG. And uh, do you find that you'd much rather be middle of the pack, or do you find that and do you find that leadership is hard? I mean, I, there's no question that it is, but paint us a picture. Yeah, I think it depends on. I, I think we have to be leaders on water, and I think that's universally felt 
at every level of our company. Um, but a, a good example of not you know, trying to find our, our right place is on the packaging side of things, which is a much more concrete example than, uh, and, and gives your on the ground perspective, right? Um, you know, uh, plastic is recyclable. Whether or not people recycle it is another question, but it is highly recyclable. PET is highly recyclable when our bottles come in. In California, we have to hit a certain amount of recycled content every year. We have made a point of having targets that are ahead of where California is and other places around the country. Um, but to hit the 50% we need for 2030, uh, we have to hit 50% recycled content across our portfolio in, in Canada at the same time. Um, we need more material and that changes that dialogue. But we have to also, for lack of a better word, celebrate the fact that we are already doing this, right? So we have bottles that say, we're advertising, this is 100% recycled content. Um, but we have to move this, you know, in other places, we have to talk about this in terms of it being a business problem. Um, you know, if, if uh, Houston and Dallas started just boring, regular curbside recycling, not a, there's other recycling policies. If they just did that, that would double the US recycling rate and we would have a ton of material available to us, right? But that doesn't happen overnight. So um, we have to talk about in terms of that is a risk for us. That is a, a business problem that we have to address. And, and we have to think about how that impacts those community, you know, how a policy rolls out, if you can even get a policy, and how do you, how do you find a way of dealing with that? I can imagine that something like climate accounting and putting some hard data and numbers to this stuff can really move a conversation forward in a way that's not what I think the the backlash is a little bit based on the idea that these conversations are values based. Um, and while values are, you know, in in uh, in some crowds you can align, and other crowds you cannot. Data is not something you can have mixed opinions about, um, at least one would think. Uh, <laughs> and I say this because uh, it, data can be a powerful tool. I mean, think about climate accounting has made it so that climate as a topic is now a matter for not just a, a chief legal officer or a sustainability officer, but also for the CFO and the CEO. These are things that land on their desk that they have to report to their boards. Um, my question is, is, let's start with you, Liz, to see, you know, do you find that climate accounting has changed the game to any degree for you guys? I mean, being able to measure, you know, how much you're recycling, being able to measure the impact of your plastic, the impact of uh, water, uh, either how much you're extracting versus how much is being replenished, any of those measures, how, how does that play out? Yeah, I think it has the biggest impact with our with our board um, because they're that's the language they speak, um, and I think that's the most helpful in driving change so that it's not just coming um, from down below or from outside of the organization, um, in particular. So, and I think climate accounting helps make it, you know, or thinking about it that way, it helps integrate it into the business. This isn't an add-on. It, I mean, it takes time to integrate it, but it's not just this extra we're doing this year, this is just gonna be part of our business from now on. And I think that it sort of normalizes it and that's really important to creating the culture around this. And is, is it hard to embark on a journey of figuring out the cost of this stuff? I mean, is it easy, is it hard? Has it been yeah, natural? No, it's, it's challenging. Good to know for anyone out there, it's gonna be hard. Um, Berkeley, I've been curious to hear, you know, what is it gonna take to get the mass of consumer goods to, to implement climate accounting so that um, these these topics are not housed in a silo, that they have a cross organization impact? Yeah, I mean, if anyone knows, tell me. Um, but <laughs> I think broadly, one thing I think about a lot with consumer sectors, and that's broadly defined, basically anyone selling to a consumer base, is for years and years, you know, consumer sectors pretty much invented marketing and trend. Um, you know, why why do we buy the things we buy seasonally? Like, yes, sure, there's a weather aspect, but most of that was just manufactured by a brand at some point and pushed to us. And then all of a sudden, when we talk about climate or sustainability, they say, oh, well, there's no consumer demand. It's like, well, you make that. Um, and so I think there is a, a shift in responsibility um, and you know accountability and, and also leveraging the, the human capital and the skills that you have toward the problem that we're trying to solve. 
Um, so I think that is a big, big piece of it for consumer sectors, particularly kind of like mainstream retail, um, is making that switch that it, it is your job to create the demand for those products. It's your job to make sustainability a non-negotiable. You know, it's, it's no longer a differentiator. It's, it's a baseline in the marketplace. And that is the responsibility of the industry to bring that to life and to allow consumers to feel informed and safe and, um, in control and like they understand what they're buying when they go and pick up your product, um, whether that's you know e-commerce or um, locally and you know brick and mortar retail. Um, I think that's that's a huge piece of it. The other piece is governance um, and really looking at how your governance structures need to evolve. A lot of consumer sectors companies restructure every year, and you know that's sort of the rhythm. But that provides opportunities and challenges, right? But in those restructures, we should be looking specifically at what are our sustainability goals, what are our climate reporting um, obligations, who are the stakeholders that we, you know, on the mandatory side need to satisfy, need to com what structures do we need to comply with, and are we setting up our governance effectively to enable us to do that? And if not, let's make some changes. Um, and that also sometimes involves board engagement, C-suite engagement, which we've talked about a bit already, um, but really, you know, getting your game board set up so that you can succeed. Um, and I think that goes really top to bottom in terms of how we're structuring within companies. If I could just add on to that, because I really do think data is going to be the game. And again, sorry, speaking as the lawyer, um, what's clearly happening now is there's going to be a lot of litigation around what data did you use to come up with these particular claims. And thinking about the consumer products area, in particular, there's you know um, already some great FTC guidelines that generally say things like you shouldn't advertise an airline as having sustainable flights. Uh, you should actually do a Greta Thunberg and get on a sailboat instead, right? It's not a sustainable air flight. Um, but drilling down in terms of what data that's going to be used in the lawsuits, uh, these groups on both sides um, are getting very well funded for litigation. So um, it was once asked, you know, we've got the anti-ESG forces, the pro-ESG forces. What can both of them really agree on? And I would say greenwashing. You know, the left says greenwashing is terrible. Don't brag about being able to have these sustainable products if you don't really have that. We'll sue you for it. And then, of course, on the right, just making any claims around being ESG, being an important driver for your business and adding really value, we're going to sue you on that. Um, so I have to say my hope is, and I'm hoping there are people in this room who know a lot more about it, that that's where AI actually is going to come into force in terms of somehow sorting the massive amount of data that's really required, especially when you start going out from scope one to scope two to scope three, to try to think how that data can be used. And if it can be used in an accounting standard way, even better. But either way, you better have your data and numbers or litigation is quite likely. Okay, but I have to play devil's advocate now. Okay. All right. We agree that measurement is the magic wand here that's going to solve all of the problems. Right. There's a Schneider Electric, uh, their CEO famously says, if you measure it, it gets done. Um, so that's like a, a very powerful statement. But there's got to be, you know, you've got to ask the question, is this data good data? Is it based on something substantive or did you make it up? Or is it based on uh, kind of a standard that doesn't really even apply to your company, but you use it because it makes you look good? I mean, question to you guys is what do you see as a challenge of, of data? It, 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 it's a double edged sword in many ways. I mean, to me, data is is a tool. Data is not the point. Data is not impact. Data is not action. Data is one of many inputs into decision making. And data is highly manipulable. The way we present it, the way we look at it, the context that we take it from or put it in changes that. And so I think there is a, a little bit of a fallacy around, you know, oh, if it's quantitative, it's real and it is fact. What really matters is what we do with that data and what we what we know about that data, how we represent it, and what we do with it. 
Um, and so while I'm very pro data and transparency and excited about the potential for technological innovation to lessen the burden that, you know, the manual nature of handling all of that data, um, I think there's also a risk of using data and uncertainty or the, the never ending pursuit of better data to stall um, and to not move forward when on many, many of these issues, particularly on you know, greenhouse gas emissions, the direction of travel is very clear. We, you know, we don't need to know anything else to know we need to cut emissions. Um, and so anything that serves to take away from that effort rather than support and accelerate that it's not good data in, in my perspective. Um, I think we see this a lot in supply chains and, um, and again, climate and GHGs are one of the most quantitative and measurable things that we're talking about in this whole ESG conversation, right? So the minute we start looking at chain of custody and raw material supply chains and commodity tracking and ensuring labor standards, this just gets harder. Um, so I think it, it is, a little bit dangerous to, to put data on too much of a pedestal. Um, and we need to, again, need to focus on, you know, where is that sweet spot of decision useful, accurate um, data that we can hold each other accountable to and trust, but where data is not the point. I, I mean, what you're describing to me is ultimately you, the governance of this flow of information of the data, the flow of priority is what actually ends up mattering. You can have all the tools at your disposal but never use them. So let's talk about that. I mean, the conference, the goal of this conference is actually to explore the role of governance um, and corporate governance and climate change. So um, Tim, why don't we start with you? You know, uh, in the next, you know, I don't think we have too much time left, but aware of the time, what can we uh, glean from where governance needs to go? I, you know, the famous advice is, you know, the point of ESG is for it to disappear because it will just be dispersed into the governance of the corporation. I think it's a really great goal. Where are we on that? Well, one thing that I guess um, as a outside lawyer I'm pleased to see is a lot of the governance is now moving more towards the legal functions, which might be a reflection of how scared people are around this litigation and compliance issues. But there has been the uh, uh, starting of a new role called ESG Council inside corporations who are really responsible for making sure certainly they coordinate on the business side, um, being aware of the various compliance structures that are needed. And also what I'm hoping that this gets pushed a little further than it did the first iteration of this three or four years ago into the strategic discussions, because that is the key. I love your points, Berkeley, about you know how do we really keep telling that narrative so that it's relevant for our business. And the right governance structure may be, yes, here's the legal framework that you're going to have to act in, but then here's where the business wants to tell a story. How far can they move and push forward on it? So at least I feel somewhat encouraged by having lawyers at the table, but hopefully these are the type of commercial lawyers who are also really understanding what's required for the business. Yeah, and I think that there's the opportunity for that to bring focus, and I think that is the single single thing we need most in this conversation because it's overwhelming. We're playing whack-a-mole with different regulations. We're chasing data points across global supply chains. Um, and it's too much. We, we don't have the budgets. We don't have the expertise. We don't have the, you know, the, the FTEs <laughs> to pull that off. And I think a governance structure that enables clear focus on, well, first identifying material issues and then enforcing that those are material issues and ensuring that you're focused on them and moving them forward creates the freedom to do the job well. Um, and I think that there's a real opportunity in sort of you know next, next level or future fit governance to focus on enabling that. And again, I think that includes the board, that includes the C-suite, and it includes you know, the dotted line and sort of cross-functional relationships within a company that allow, um, allow and, and again, reinforce that focus um, sort of day to day. I agree with all of what you both said, and I just want to give an example. So as a, a, a water company um, that is, you know, a consumer-facing water company, we have been doing certain practices for years, 
and have data, but that doesn't mean it made it, it, it has not been necessarily part of um, the governance structure of our company. And, and we are a new, while our brands have been around forever, we were, um, we have new ownership. We were previously owned by Nestle Waters. And that the change in ownership, which was good for us in many, many ways, also kind of shook people because it, it questioned some of the practices we had. And now it's very clear that things need to be enshrined in governance in order to protect our, ass, our spring assets and uh, make sure that we are continuing to be water resilient. And so it, there's a real practical application to this as well in terms of us being a sustainable business. So what does that look like when it's built into the governance? I mean, is it a an executive compensation metric or is it um, every employee is measured on uh, their focus on water uh, replenishment? You know, and this is not just a question for you, Liz, but a question for the rest of the panelists, too. You know, what does that look like? What is a good governance structure that has really embodied the priority of climate really look like? Yeah, well, right now, I mean, it is built into compensation, or climate in, in a broad way. Um, I, we are looking at water replenishment as a specific goal um, coming in the next couple of years. So that's, that is, that's a big one. It's a big one. <laughs> um, and, and figuring that out um, and going beyond what we already do, which is never to take more than what nature provides or, and, and going beyond natural recharge. Um, but it's, acknowledging those in a more formal way than just this is our casual practice. And I'll use a really specific example that I s sort of stumbled on and I'm not sure how much I should share, but, but in doing our CDP reporting, one of the questions on the, the water questionnaire was, do you have a water policy? No, because it's just intuitive. We just have, you know, we're going to get one, right? But, but it was just like, <laughs> why? This is, all, this is all we do. We live this water stewardship all the time. And it was kind of like a shock to everyone. Like, oh, we got to think about this differently now. Yeah, the only additional piece I might uh, add, there was a movement on some boards saying, we need our sustainability person. You know, we need that person who's the absolute expert on sustainability. I have to say, I wasn't sure that's the right way to go. Um, I think that because of all the discussions we've talked about, how sustainability is strategically linked to many other parts of the business, if you are sort of relying on this one person, she is going to be the one who's going to give you all the advice on that. It is not going to sync up as well as it should for the rest of the company. So at least we've seen that we have seen um, some sustainability committees um, uh, hive off to just approach a particular issue, but it's great if you can get the, you know, the finance person and the marketing person and somebody who has maybe some sustainability environmental pieces behind that to flush that out. But just sort of trying to recruit the sustainability person, I personally am a little skeptical. Yeah, I'll chime in on behalf of consultants everywhere and say it depends. Um, but, you know, I think there there is no ideal governance system. There's no slide with here are the here are the lines and the functions and here's how it works. The right governance system is the one that enables information and capital to flow in the directions that it needs to at the speed it needs to to enable your goals. Um, and so I think that incorporates, you know, having leadership that is equipped to know what those goals ought to be and support efforts toward them. And that's evolving. Um, and then again, creating that internal infrastructure that allows that flow. Um, and that can look many different ways and can and should evolve. Um, and it may require a little bit of experimentation and it may come down to, you know, what are your internal um, data systems look like and what works best with that in terms of who is in charge of this or that set of data and bringing it to the table. But it is that bringing the information, the skills, the perspective from whatever corner of the organization it sits in to relevant decisions and, you know, accountability conversations that I think is, is critical to um, success and to actually being able to move toward um, the goals that you've set for your enterprise. That's fantastic, especially the point on speed, uh, which gets missed a lot. You know, sometimes you think governance is about layers um, or, or maybe d diminishing the layers and the hopes that you just create width, but actually 
Um, it's, it's not about either of those. There's no structure. It is about the speed. Uh, you know, mindful of the time, I want to end this panel with some really fantastic questions, I think, that uh, uh, may be something we talk about next summit. So uh, why don't we start with you, Tim, and tell us, what is one or two big questions that you hope that the world has answered by the time we get back here uh, in March next year? Probably not March. This is an easy start. one. Um, so sorry to come back to this climate cartel idea, but I am very concerned. There is clearly, um, if you look at how businesses are operating, the need for collaboration to attack the climate change problem. And if we have now started to make collaborations by definition under the legal structure look like they're anti-competitive, we're at a real risk here. So, um, you know, we've done advising on various net zero asset alliances, and you've heard about members starting to drop out because they're worried that this might be anti-competitive um, in the U.S. And I'd love for us to have a discussion for next year um, if you look at the UK antitrust, if you look at the EU antitrust, they're already starting to say, can we see that there are more benefits that flow to the particular concerned individuals when there is a potential tightening of um, uh, competition? So if you know, there is an agreement around single-use plastics, Yes, that might drive up the uh, cost just a little bit to uh, um, <laughs> customers, hopefully not, but certainly no one's going to be a first mover there. We need to have a collaborative approach around packaging and so many other issues. So I'm hoping that's one area the law can, uh, can take some real strides. Yeah, absolutely agree. And, you know, collaboration is core to BSR's theory of change and the way we work and the way we have worked on these issues for over 30 years. Um, so definitely uh, upvote that. And congrats to Reddit on the IPO. Um, but I think if I think about where I hope we are in a year, um, well, A, I hope all of you have gone home and solved climate change. But if we don't get there, I hope we're in a place where we're, we're not we're not lost in the minutia. We're through legal challenges to frameworks, and we are in the work and are finding finding that glide path between complying, checking boxes, doing what we need to do, um, and that's important. I don't want to downplay that at all, but also that we can look around and say, okay, we've, we've done that. We've taken steps there, and we have not retrenched on any of the action side. We have not um, taken resources from that side to fund the compliance side, or if we have, we've done it on a very temporary basis and are starting to shift the other direction. I hope we're back to um, the content and impact conversation more than you know quibbling over indicators and frameworks and which country is you know, yelling at this one about this or that acronym. I hope we've taken a big a big step forward um, toward that streamlining and back toward action and impact. Uh, this is a tough question. Uh, I I think it's going to be a hard road for a lot of external reasons over the next year. And I think we should, when we get to next year, whatever the conversation is, we should not diminish the small steps that are made right now. Uh, and that there is progress being made little by little um, as, as we move forward. And that this conversation is being furthered just by the persistence of having the conversation. And I think that's that's part of it. I appreciate the three of you for enlightening us. Uh, we have a, a, like three more minutes. So I'm going to ask you one question, which is uh, kind of similar, but on the other end of it, what are you most concerned about? Um, and then what will have you seen as a, an accomplishment of the field? You can answer both or either. I'll just answer one of those. Um, here's one for uh, the lawyers, uh, Chevron deference. Um, I'm quite concerned, as many of you know, that uh, the Chevron case allowed certain discretion among regulators to um, act, and that's about to be thrown out. 
so that every decision around the very complicated area that we're dealing with here um, around climate change will now be decided in the courts. And I'm quite concerned that regulators are going to be quite weak um, in over the next several years, which is when we need them to be the strongest. Yeah, I mean, I think we've talked a lot about, you know, our sort of hopes and dreams as well as fears and risks in this space. Um, I think the biggest thing I think about um, is a little bit higher level and sort of I, I really hope and I actively work to put a finger on the scale in this, but really hope we don't lose the plot. Let's keep the point in mind and ask ourselves whether it's, you know, decisions we're making within a corporate entity, we're advising a client, we're participating in regulatory conversations, you know, why, why are we doing this? And is this decision moment in service of that goal? Um, and so, you know, my fear is that we won't <laughs> do that. Um, and my, my hope and what I would you know, view as real progress is that we do and we have taken that step, however small, um, in that direction over you know, the next year, a couple of years. Liz, bring us, uh, bring us uh, back home around uh, what, we, what we should expect in water. Maybe we'll have solved the water crisis. Well, it keeps raining, so <laughs> I mean, that's always good in our business. Um, except in the summer, we want it to be very sunny and we want you to buy water. Um, <laughs> I think in the water space, the, even though I just made light of it, I think the fact that, at least in the Southwest, it is a, a li there, we have room to breathe helps having a better dialogue. Um, and that when we were at the crisis point, we were, it, it was, there was so much emotion involved that that was really problematic. Water is an incredibly emotional issue too. That's a whole other summit you can have. Um, so I, I think giving us the, having this kind of calm moment allows that to, to be tackled in a different way and, and recognizing that the professionals in water have an idea of how to solve this um, and bringing that to the equation. Um, and we're, we're part of that. Um, you know, we've long been, uh, because of our, our water stewardship and what we have thought, sought sought to do, we have helped other water utilities and how they have been made to be more efficient. And something that there's a lot of knowledge, I'm trying to say, in this industry that can be shared and we can get to a better place on it. Uh, and we can, we should trust those professionals who understand the hydrogeology of the places where they work. Well, on that fantastic note, please join me in thanking our panelists for today's discussion.